Well, let's give the Lord praise. He is worthy. Our soul does need to magnify the Lord, as we heard in the words of that beautiful song by Chris Tomlin. We need to express our love for God, our appreciation for God, our thankfulness, and our adoration. And as we continue in God's Word today in our worship, it's important that we let God's Word go deep into our soul. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to have you take your Bibles with me, and let's look again at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, this is our fourth Sunday looking at this scripture and seeing the relevancy for our lives today and the impact that it has for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read verse 2 and then verse 6 and 7. Please follow along as I read God's word. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called mighty, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now keep your Bibles open. I trust that you also have a, an outline that you can follow along. Hold it up so I can see that you all have one. All right, good. Now you can fill that in. There's just a few blanks there, so you know you don't have a whole lot to do, but please uh, take opportunity to fill in uh, other information that God brings to you as God's word comes today. It's important for us to recognize that God is speaking directly to us. He's speaking directly to us through his word. The word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works within the life of the believer so that we recognize the truth of God's word and when we recognize the truth of God's word and it becomes a conviction, then we're going to live it out. I often say we live what we believe. If you want to know what I believe, just watch how I live. Listen to my words, watch my actions. It'll reveal to you what my convictions are. I trust that the, the same is true of you. Today we look at the, the name, the throne name, name of the Messiah, Prince of Peace. Now what comes to your mind when you hear the word peace. Let's just pause for a moment here. Let's just reflect on the word peace. What comes to your mind? Quiet. Anything else? Calm. No worry. No war. Okay. And I would add no worry. Wow, that's a tough one. Happy. Okay. You know, there was a, a time in our country when uh, this symbol was pretty dominant. Recognize that symbol? Any of you had that on your car at one time in the past? Okay, a few of you have. All right, well, you know, growing up in Southern California, that, that uh, peace symbol was uh, very prevalent in the culture in which I grew up. Well, I did a little investigating just to find out some, some history as to the origin of this symbol. Well, the symbol really goes back to the 1950s. And it was the peace symbol. It was designed as the logo for the British campaign for nuclear disarmament. The Brits came up with this one. Any Brits here? Okay, we got, a, we got one here. All right, maybe two. Okay, well, they came up with this unique symbol uh, for the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Well, now in the 1960s, well, we know what happened. The anti-war activists and and counterculture individuals. Some of you may be here today, but you've been redeemed, and uh, Jesus <laughs> has brought you to a new place, as he's brought me to a new place. And, and we come to recognize, even though this is an international symbol now, it only represents a certain culture. Now, someone put up the two fingers, the peace. Okay, Melanie here. I can still remember when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, 
for the very first time. How many of you remember that? I mean, I was just a little squirt, but I can still remember. Ed Sullivan, the Beatles were on. It was Sunday night. You know, I was brought up in a tradition that you didn't watch TV on Sunday, but for some reason my parents let me watch this. And I remember Ed Sullivan going like this. You know, he was given the peace sign. I mean, he was, the Beatles were there and they were playing whatever they played that night. But, you know, peace has a, a different meaning for different people in different parts of the world. And, you know, for some of us, peace is going to be when Christmas is over, the New Year's over, and things get back to normal. For others, peace is, you know, after you've had the grandkids for a whole week and you send them home to mom and dad, and then there's peace again. You know, we, we, we think of peace in a, in a lot of different manners. Well, looking at the, the Wikipedia, which is the, you know, the world encyclopedia. I mean, if you want to find out something, go to Wikipedia online. And, and uh, peace is described this way. Peace is a sign of harmony characterized by the lack of violence, conflict behaviors, and the freedom from fear of violence. Someone said, no war. I, I think that would pretty well fit this categorization. But also not just war in the sense that we know it, fighting between, between nations, but fighting between people, relationships. Can we just have some peace in the house? H have any of you ever said that? Yeah. All right, can we just have a, <laughs> a little peace here? Well, you know, it's important for us at this time of the year to think about the peace of God. Now, one artist, in their mind, they describe peace in a very unique way. The title of the painting is Peace. And the painting shows the uh, coastline, could be the Oregon coastline, with rocks. And the waves are beating against these rocks. A, a, a storm is raging. The wind is blowing. A and you would hardly say, now how can that be characterized as a, a picture of peace? But then if you notice closely on that picture, down in the corner, there's a little bird sitting on a nest in one of the crags of the rock, and that little bird has the look of serenity, peace. The little bird is safe on the nest, even though the storm is raging all around it. Peace. Being in a place of safety. Being in a place where you know you're secure. See, when we look at the scriptures today, we recognize the peace that this world is looking for will never really happen. We have wars, we have turmoil, we have broken relationships. There will never be that peace that some are marching and holding up signs saying, world peace, world peace. The peace that God brings to us is peace in the heart. It's a lasting peace. It's not dependent on circumstances and situations because how many of you know circumstances change minute by minute? We never know from one moment to the next what is going to happen. Peace is a place of safety and security in Jesus Christ. It was over 2,000 years ago that the Father sent angels from his throne to earth to visit some poor shepherds on a field outside of Bethlehem. And Luke chapter 2 tells us in verse 13 and 14 that suddenly a, a great company of angels appeared and they sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, peace on those whom his favor rests. The living Bible puts it this way, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth for all those pleasing to him. In other words, that helps us understand true peace comes in the hearts of those who are in a relationship with the living God. Not war ceasing, families stop fighting. No, it's all about what happens in the heart. The angels brought the message of the revelation of God that the Christ, the Messiah, he would be a true prince of peace. 
He is the one who would bring peace to humanity. As we look at our scripture here today, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we see again one of these specific names of the Messiah, the Christ, Prince of Peace. On your outline, I have a place for you to fill in a couple blanks there. It literally, the name means peaceful prince. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is a peaceful prince. Now, the Hebrew word there for peace is shalom. Turn to someone next to you and just say shalom. Shalom. You see, in Israel today, if you were to go uh, to a hotel or, or go to a place, uh, they would greet you as shalom. It's a common greeting. But the, the meaning here in the Hebrew is much deeper than just a greeting. It's a condition of peace. It's what takes place within the heart of an individual. It's, it's a peace that is lasting an inner peace. It's a spiritual peace that no one can rob you of. It's a peace that only God can give. The true shalom of God. God instructed Moses to say to Aaron, the first high priest over the nation of Israel, to bless the people. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord give you Shalom, peace, everlasting peace because of a relationship with the everlasting God. The Messiah would come to change hearts. Put that on your bulletin there, your uh, outline. The Messiah would come to change hearts. See, if we miss that reality, then we miss everything about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. We have to recognize that he goes deep within each individual to have us search out our own hearts. Do we have peace with God? See, we may have peace in the house for a while. We may even have peace in our nation. And we may even think that there's peace in the world, but we know that's not true. But the real issue is, do we have peace in our hearts with the God who created us? with the God who came for us, Emmanuel, God with us, for the God who's going to return someday at the end of the world. Do we have peace because of our relationship with him? You see, as the Jews read the scripture that we read here this morning, they got confused when they saw Jesus and tried to compare Jesus with Isaiah chapter 9. Because here it says in verse 7, follow with me in your Bibles, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. See, that's where they got tripped up. Because the Jews were looking for a Christ who would deliver them from the dictatorship of Rome. The, the soldiers that held them captive. They were looking for one like David who would bring back those good old days, victorious days, conquering days. The enemies would be slain. The Goliaths would be annihilated. They were expecting the Christ to set them free from the other, other governments that ruled over them. They wanted their own government to be the world power. They wanted the Christ to rule from Israel or from uh, Jerusalem in Israel and be the dominant world power. See, in their hearts, the Jewish people were looking for an earthly king. Jesus, the Son of God, came as the Prince of Peace to establish the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom. It takes place in your heart and in my heart. And it's a kingdom that rules and reigns forever and ever. See, Jesus let those Jewish leaders down because they had expectations. Do you know that there are people today that have felt Jesus has let them down? They've got certain expectations. If Jesus is really God, then why doesn't he do this for me? And why doesn't he do that? And how come he doesn't live up to my expectations? 
And the Lord says, I came for something much deeper, much more real, something that's everlasting. Don't miss the point of my coming. See, Isaiah 53, if we turn there in our Bibles, we discover the true point of Jesus' coming. Go there with me for a moment because it's so significant that you recognize God's plan. See, we can talk about man's plan, but what good is man's plan? It's temporal. It's going to end. I want God's plan. That's why I'm here today, folks. I want the living word of God to speak into my heart so that when I face difficulties and trials and testing, I'm going to hold true to what is true. Now, Isaiah chapter 53, we see here a couple verses, verses 3 through 6 and then verses 10 through 11. We see that God's plan was different than the expectations of the Jews and the expectations of many people today. Isaiah 53, look with me at verse 3. This is revealing who the Messiah is and what he would do. He was despised and what? Rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with what? Suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. Despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him, him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our what? Our transgressions. My sin nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. I can have everything in the world, but if I don't have faith in Jesus Christ, I will never have peace in my heart. Never. It's because of the price Jesus paid when I believe on him, I can have peace that he offers. He was crushed for Pete's iniquity. See, it's important that we put our own name there, that we recognize what God did for us. That's why the Messiah came. And the punishment, look at this, what Isaiah says here in verse 5. The punishment that brought us what? Peace. Say it a little louder. Peace. There it is. There's the revelation of God regarding the plan of God. It was the punishment upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that brought us peace. It was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Then look at verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. See, this is God's plan. Many people today, as they celebrate Christmas, they miss that plan. And they miss everything that Christmas really stands for. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, that's key for us, folks. Jesus paid for my guilt, my sin, what I deserve. Here it says, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of what? The light of life. That's what happened when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And be satisfied. By his knowledge and my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And we could go on and on and on. But see, here's the revelation of God concerning the will of God. That the one who would come as the prince of peace would come to pay for the sin of the world. That's God's will and his plan that we might be set free and have the peace of God in our heart. How many people today at Christmas time truly have the peace of God? And again, I'll say it very clear. If there's no peace with God, then there's no true celebration of Christ's coming. We need to recognize that God the Father was serious when he sent his only begotten son to be Emmanuel, God with us. There's no personal peace without accepting Jesus Christ. You can try everything you want. You can buy as many things as you want. You can go on as many vacations or you can do whatever you think is going to make you happy. But it's not about being happy. 
It's about having true peace through a relationship with the living God and knowing that the God of peace is in your heart. Philippians, on your outline there, I have a little bit of a correction to make. Instead of Ephesians, it should say Philippians. Philippians 4, verses 9, 4 through 9. There the Apostle Paul talks about the peace of God that comes through faith in God. And the end result is we know the God of peace. Without knowing the God of peace, you cannot have peace with God. Look with me at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and, and 14, because here the Apostle Paul explains clearer for us so that we understand that we don't miss the relevancy of what Christ did on our behalf. Colossians chapter 1, look with me at verse 13 and verse 15, uh, 14. Here it says, For he, that's Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins and then go with me to verse 19 and 20 because here's the tie-in here's where it all comes together for our understanding so we won't be ignorant verse 19 for god was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven making what peace there's that wonderful word here's the shalom making peace through his blood shed on what the cross did you catch what the apostle paul was saying rescued redemption reconciled the three r's that unless we truly recognize god came in the flesh on that first christmas morning to rescue us so that we might be redeemed. The word means bought back. God bought us back because he loved us so deeply. He gave himself. As Isaiah said, he was punished. He suffered. He was crushed in death. And that's why he came that first Christmas morning that he would give his life so that we might be, here's the third R, reconciled, brought back to God, that we might, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you see, as we partake of communion shortly, we're going to celebrate what Christmas really is all about. It's God rescuing us, redeeming us, and reconciling us that we might know the God of peace and have the peace of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You see, that gives me joy at Christmas. That gives me joy not just at Christmas, it gives me joy each and every day that I live. It gives me joy knowing that one day when I see the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, I will have no fear because my faith in him has brought me into a relationship that will never, ever end. In closing, I'd like to just share with you what Jesus says. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, I am with you always. Now that gives me peace. Because as I look ahead to a new year, I have no idea what, night, what 2014 holds. I don't think you do either. It's the great unknown in the human realm. But we can have peace with God, whether there's trial, whether there's testing, whether there's tribulation for our faith, whatever the coming year holds, we can have peace because we have a relationship with the God of peace. Some of you enjoy church history. Years ago, I read the story of Polycarp. He was one of the early church fathers. He lived from 69 A.D. to 156 A.D. It said that the Apostle John, the longest living apostle, was his mentor. It's said in church history that he was the bishop of Smyrna. That's one of those seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus wrote a letter to. It said that one day the Roman authorities came and took him 
an elderly man of 85 years old, took him away and said, either curse Christ or die. Curse Christ or die. Well, they took him into the arena where there were thousands cheering, laughing, mocking, because here was an individual who stood for Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And the proconsul, the Roman proconsul, said one more time, and I'm going to quote the words, swear and I will release you, revile Christ, to which Polycarp, this great man of faith, replied, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he never did me wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king that has saved me? He was then burned at the stake in martyrdom, dying with peace in his heart because the God of peace was with him in his death. And he knew without a shadow of the doubt that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, would soon receive him into glory. Friends, as we celebrate Christmas this year, do we have the same assurance that Polycarp had that even if I have to die for my faith in the coming days, the coming weeks, the coming months, the coming years, I will never turn back, but I will recognize that I have peace with God in my dying because I know the God of peace. See, if we can say that, I'm willing to die for Christ, he's my prince of peace, then we need to ask ourselves here today, are we willing then to live for Christ as the prince of peace, the princely, the peaceful prince who rules and reigns with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, and is coming back in all his glory to receive his church unto himself. If we're willing then to live for Christ, let us do that beginning today and carry it over into tomorrow and into Christmas Day and into every day. Let us fulfill what was on the heart of Francis of Assisi. You should each have a copy of the prayer that was passed out. I believe it's fitting as we conclude the message and prepare our hearts to receive the communion, to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, Christ coming as Emmanuel, that we say, Lord, use me to fulfill the plan of God. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen and amen.